Hello, and welcome to today's video on the introduction to complex designs. As always, before we get started, please make sure that you have the PowerPoint lecture notes printed and in front of you so that you can take notes along the way. Today, we're going to introduce complex designs by talking a little bit about the motivation for running them, and then we'll also have some conversation about how we might begin to analyze complex designs. So let's jump right in and begin with some ideas that come right out of our reading on complex designs. We'll start out with three potential pop quiz questions, and we'll give you the chance to stop the video and answer these. These are, first, what is a synonym for a complex design? Second, what is the simplest complex design? And third, explain the primary advantage associated with complex designs. We'll let you stop the video and respond to those questions. Okay, welcome back. We'll go over the answers to these today. And so our first question was, what is a synonym for complex design? And the synonym that we're looking for here is factorial design. In a factorial design, just as in a complex design, we have more than one independent variable. Okay, question two, what is the simplest complex design? And here the answer is just a little bit tricky. The simplest complex design, which is to say the simplest factorial design, would be what we call a two by two design. And the reason that's the simplest kind of complex design is a two by two design has two levels of each of its two variables. It only contains two independent variables, each of which contains two levels. And this is why we say we have a two by two design. We could have a two by three design, but that would be just a little bit more complicated than a two by two. Notably, if we did have a two by three design, we would still have two independent variables. One of them would have two levels, the other would have three levels. But here we're talking about the simplest kind of complex design, or the simplest kind of factorial design. And the idea would be that a two by two is the simplest of that variety. Okay, let's go on to question three. Explain the primary advantage associated with complex designs. Hopefully you were able to generate something about the interaction effect, which we sometimes call the combined effect. You'll recall that we frequently return to the research cycle. And the research cycle begins in our upper right corner of that diagram with some kind of reference to the real world. In the science of psychology, we're interested in real world thoughts, feelings, and behaviors of whatever the organism might be. And that turns out to be a very complicated phenomenon, behaviors, thoughts, and feelings, or set of phenomena. And what we want to do is understand how those real world phenomena uh, might be occurring in our day-to-day -day lives. And there are many variables playing a role there. So up to this point in the semester, we've only looked at one independent variable at a time. But in the real world, things are very multivariate. That is to say, we have more than one independent variable influencing a given phenomenon, whether that's a behavior or a thought or a feeling. So what we try to do then is understand how these multiple independent variables might be combining or interacting. And that's really our motivation and our primary advantage for going to a complex design. Okay, let's see if we can get some practice now reading graphs from complex designs, and we'll see if in the next series of graphs, we can have you first give us the script that we learned a while ago for reading graphs, and then we'll see if we can apply this idea of a complex design to some graphs that we're going to see in the next few slides. So we'll have you first describe each graph and also indicate whether each is simple or complex, and I'll walk us through these. You might remember that our script was that we begin by saying in this graph, and we state the dv, which is plotted here on the, ver the vertical axis, called the ordinate, is plotted as a function of the iv, which is the variable shown on the x-axis. That's how we always begin. So in this case, we would say, in this graph, motion sensitivity is plotted as a function of Q condition. This would be an example of a one-way analysis because there's only one independent variable. By the way, that one independent variable, Q condition, happens to have three levels, which are valid Q, no Q, and invalid Q. So we have really here a simple design, not a complex design, because we have only the one independent variable. It happens to have three levels. Okay, if we now change the graph to something that we have here, we'll have to alter our script a little bit to incorporate a second independent variable. And our script might then go something like this. In this graph, discriminability is plotted as a function of task with training as the parameter. I'll say that again. In this graph, discriminability, that's our dependent variable, is plotted as a function of task, that's our first independent variable, with training as the parameter. And that happens to have two levels of training, before and after training. We have three levels of task. So we would say that this is, in fact, a complex design because we have two independent variables, task and training. And we might also say that this is a 
two by three design. We have two levels of one IV, three levels of the other. Equivalently, we can say we have a three by two. We make no particular distinction between the statement two by three versus three by two. We use those terms interchangeably. But it does convey to your audience something about the so-called dimensionality of your study. What are its dimensions? And we have multiple dimensions as soon as we have multiple independent variables as we have here. Okay, okay here's another example that happens to be a two by three. And we might say something like this. If we were asked to describe this graph and you were to write some text for this graph, you might use something like the following. In this graph, mean duration of eye contact is plotted as a function of gender pairing with conversant as the parameter. And we mentioned a moment ago, this is a three by two, equivalently a two by three. We have two levels of the conversant variable, black and white. We have three levels of the gender pairing variable, male pairs, female pairs, male female pairs. Okay, so this is a three by two, just as the earlier graph had been a three by two. Okay. All right, why don't we see if we can go on from there and we'll ask a very different kind of a question, but also one that takes us back to something that we learned earlier. This is an oldie but goodie. Which of these two graphs, the one on the left or the one on the right, is messed up? We'll let you stop the video and see if you can respond to that question. Okay, welcome back. Hopefully you came to the conclusion that the graph on the right is quote unquote messed up. That's an informal phrase. And what we mean by that informal phrase is that there's something wrong with this graph in the sense that we've lost proportionality. We typically do like to show our audience proportional graphs, and we do have proportionality here when we're plotting a zero in the lower left corner. Let's go over this graph in the more formal sense using our script. And this graph, mean height in inches, is plotted as a function of gender. And in this particular case, we have male and female shown, starting with a zero in the lower left corner. Over here, we're now starting at 60. As a consequence of starting at 60, we actually overemphasize the difference between the male heights and the female heights. In fact, over here, it almost looks like a mean of 58 versus 54, excuse me, 68 versus 64 inches. There's a four inch difference there, and that looks like it's a two to one difference. But in reality, the actual difference between male heights and female heights looks more like this, which is to say that in the real world, it's really not the case that adult males are twice the size of adult females, but this graph would have you believe that because it's messed up. It lacks proportionality. Okay, so why don't we have you do this? Why don't we have you stop the video and jot down any questions or comments that you might have so far about our introduction to complex designs? Okay, welcome back. We'll now proceed to the analysis of, com of complex designs. And in doing that, we're going to talk over the next couple of videos about three major concepts. These are going to be the idea of main effects, the idea of interactions, and the idea of simple effects. In today's video, we're only going to take the first two of those. We'll save the so-called simple effects for the next video. Today, we're going to focus on main effects and interactions, and we'll begin with main effects. Okay, so the main effect can be defined this way. The overall effect of one independent variable in a complex design. Remember that we have more than one independent variable, but we're looking at the overall effect of one variable at a time when we're analyzing the main effect. And how do we go about doing that? Here's something that will take a little bit of practice, but we will read you the rule first, and then we'll see if we can apply that rule over a few graphs here and a few more also in the classroom. So here's how we go about d understanding the main effect. A main effect of one IV or one independent variable is assessed or evaluated by collapsing across, that is to say, averaging over all levels of the other IV. So that's a bit of a mouthful. We'll see if we can get some practice doing this. When we consider the main effects, we're going to temporarily simplify the complexity of our design. We're going to take this factorial design and minimize it, reduce it down to just a, a simple kind of design as if there had been only one independent variable at a time. So for example, in an A by B design, and we do say A by B when we're showing these symbols A, X, B, we might have two levels of factor A and three levels of factor B. In some of the earlier graphs we had seen, we had exactly that. We had a two by three. If we were to consider the main effect of factor A, then factor B goes away momentarily in this analysis, and we're back to a simple design with one factor, and that's one with two levels, and that was factor A, had two, just two levels. 
Then we can do the reverse of that. We can consider the main effect of factor B, and when we do that, factor A temporarily goes away from our analysis. We're no longer interested in the effect of factor A just for the moment, and we're back to a simple design of one factor that happens to have three levels. There are three levels in factor B. So it's a way of simplifying the design. There are many different ways of doing that. This um, manner of using averaging is what characterizes a main effect, and we'll give you an example here. So we'll ask you in class to try to describe the main effect of training, which we'll call factor A. Training, as you might recall up here, is our parameterized variable. And we'll say that in this particular case, we have the two different levels of our training variable symbolized by either a black color or a white color. And the question on the floor is, is there a main effect for this variable? Since we're thinking about main effects, we have to get rid of the other variable. We have to somehow average over it. So how do we do that? Well, I'll ask you to hearken back to maybe 7th, 8th, or 9th grade, whenever it was that you were first introduced to algebra. And it might be that your algebra teacher had asked you to get in the habit of combining like terms or collecting like terms. We're going to use that same rule here. We're going to try to collect like terms, and like terms will be defined by their similarity along this dimension, the training dimension. We have black bars and we have white bars. So let's take an average, for example, of the white bars. And we don't even have to literally do this inside of Excel or on a calculator. Instead, we can take a mental average of these white bars, and we might take that very tall white bar and average it with these two, and that would average out perhaps to something like this as a rough approximation. Then what we can do is try to take averages of the black bars. We'll combine those or collect those like terms. They're alike because they're shown here in black. They're at the same level of the independent variable. So we'll take that average, that average, I'm sorry, that bar, that bar, and that bar. We'll average those, and we get a lower mean for the black bars than we would likely have for the white bars. And because our white and black bars are going to have different averages, then there's a good chance that we have an effect for that variable. When we're talking about having an effect for a variable, we're saying, does that variable generate a difference on our dependent variable? And it looks like the white bars, at least on average, are generating higher discriminability than is the case for the black bars. Stated another way, it looks like discriminability is actually greater after training than it was before training. There appears to be an effect of training. Notice that we've made this statement without ever directly referring to any of the specific levels of our task variable. Our task variable itself comes in three flavors, if you will, the direction task, the speed task, and the luminance task. We didn't mention anything about those tasks, though, when we were looking at the main effect of our other variable, the training variable. Let's see if we can get a little bit more practice by now doing the reverse, and that is we'll look at the same graph one more time, but we'll see if we can pull out a different piece of information. Specifically here, we'll be looking at so-called factor B, and that'll be the factor task, or the independent variable task. Now the trick is to make this black and white variable of training go away, and we can do this again by using our averaging rule and remembering what we learned in grade school or uh, maybe late grade school or early uh, middle school about collecting like terms. Okay, so what we're going to do here is collect like terms one more time, and now the likeness is going to be defined along this dimension of task. So within the task variable, we have direction as one of our levels, and we actually have a black and white bar within direction. So what we can do is combine that one with that one on average. That would be about here for their height on the y-axis. Okay. We can do the same thing for the speed task, and that would generate a lower height or a lower value in discriminability. And then we can do this a third time. We get an even slightly lower value still for the luminance task. So of these three tasks, it looks like averaging over the other variable, we're generating the highest performance in the direction task, quite a bit lower for speed, and just a little bit lower than that for luminance. We probably then do have a statistically significant main effect for task, why? Because the task variable seems to be generating a difference in discriminability. Specifically, it looks like direction training is generating, or excuse me, the direction task is generating the highest level of discriminability. Okay, so that's how we would pull out these main effects. Okay, now what we'll try to do is develop some intuitions about interactions. But before we do that, I hope you'll take a moment and stop the video and jot down what's been clear or not so clear about our conversation so far on main effects. Okay, welcome back. 
We're going to now proceed to the second of our three major categories when we're trying to understand the analysis of complex designs. We've already talked about main effects. Now we're going to talk about the second major topic, which is interactions. And we have that one last topic called simple effects. We'll address that in another video. Getting back to the interactions, we'll start out by trying to develop an intuition in this way. We'll ask about what chemicals we might have that are, when alone, harmless, but when combined, potentially lethal. And you might be able to think of many different kinds of examples. One that I think is known to a lot of folks is ammonia and bleach. And that would be the, that if you were to take ammonia all by itself, and you were to inhale some fumes from your container of ammonia, that all by itself would not be lethal. So factor A, ammonia, is not lethal. If we now go over to our second chemical, which is bleach, uh, that'll be our factor B. If we were to inhale some bleach, that all by itself would not be lethal. However, as you might know, if you combine A and B, that is to say, if you combine ammonia and bleach, the fumes that come out of that are indeed lethal. So now we have the case where factor A all by itself is not harmful, factor B all by itself is not harmful, but the interaction has a tremendous effect, and in this case, a potentially lethal effect. So here, we're reminded of the importance of these combined effects. In the real world, Factors really do interact, and we need to pull them together inside of one of our complex or factorial designs. And we need to understand this combined effect or its interaction. Okay, so why don't we go ahead and talk a little bit about how we might define an interaction. An interaction can be defined as the phenomena that occurs when the effect of one independent variable depends on the level of a second independent variable. Okay, and this takes a little bit of um, uh, practice in trying to understand. So what we're going to do is learn some tricks for seeing how we might be able to discern whether we have an interaction in a data set or not. And we'll think about data sets two different ways. We'll think about data sets that might be graphed and those that might be shown in a table. And we have slightly different tricks for discerning whether there's an interaction in graphs versus interactions in tables. But they're really based on the same kind of a principle. So here's the first of our sneaky tricks for determining whether we have an interaction. We'll apply this to graph. The first trick requires looking for parallel, parallel lines, uh, or at least parallel trends in graphs. If the lines or trends in a graph are parallel, then there is no interaction. Okay? And let's state that another way. To the extent that lines or trends depart from parallel, there is an interaction. So the phrase, to the extent, contains a lot of caution. Let me see if I can do this by gesticulation. Let's say that we have a graph that shows one line like this, and another line like this. Those two lines are more or less parallel to each other. And according to our information here, that would suggest that we have no interaction. To the extent that we get a departure from parallelism, then we're getting more and more evidence for an interaction. In the limit, if we have perfectly crisscrossing lines, we have very, very strong evidence for an interaction. So to the extent that we get departures from parallelism, we have evidence for an interaction. And we'll get some practice on this. Okay, so in this particular graph, we're going to understand first what's being plotted. On the y-axis, we have the mean number of errors, and that's being plotted as a function of type of task with hemisphere as the parameter. The type of task comes in two flavors, spatial and verbal, and we also have two different hemispheres, the left and right hemispheres. So we're under trying to understand what is the effective task on mean number of errors, what is the effective hemisphere on the mean number of errors. But critically today, we're trying to learn about the interaction. What is the combined effect of task and hemisphere on the number of errors that we might be generating? Okay. So what we'll do is see if we can take advantage of our rule for pulling out interactions from graphs like this. Importantly, you might notice that we actually don't have a line graph drawn here. We do have instead a column graph. So this imposes on us a little bit of mental imagery that we might want to exercise to understand what's going on here when we try to combine like terms. So what we'll do first is start up here, look at the right hemisphere's per, uh, number of errors for the spatial task, and we'll draw an imaginary line, if you will, over to its corresponding point on the verbal task. So we're connecting these like terms, and we're getting appreciation for that slope. Then we'll do the same thing for the left hemisphere case. We'll go from here to here. And what you might notice is that those lines are more or less parallel to each other. We have something more or less like that going on, these parallel lines. And because we have parallel lines, we have very little evidence for an interaction. So in this graph, we have almost no evidence for an interaction visually. Strictly speaking, 
what you'd want to do is have the data set for this graph, and you'd run a formal ANOVA on this, maybe an SPSS or some other kind of software package, and you'd be able to tell in a very precise way whether you have an interaction or not. But in this class, we're trying to develop your quantitative reasoning. And we're hoping that you can begin to learn such tricks as forming these imaginary lines and asking, to what extent are they parallel? And if they are parallel, we have very little evidence for an interaction. As they begin to depart from parallelism, we have evidence for an interaction. Let's do one more bit before we move on. Let's see if we can go back and remind ourselves of how we would extract the two possible main effects from this graph. On the one hand, we can ask, is there a main effect for type of task? When we're asking about that, we're essentially asking the question, is the spatial task generating a different number of errors than is the verbal task? And to do that, we're going to combine like terms. We'll connect these two, because they're both spatial tasks, and that's generating this level of error. Then we can combine these two, and we're getting noticeably fewer errors. So there's a pretty good chance that we're getting a main effect of type of task with the spatial task generating more errors than the verbal task. Again, whether that's actually going to be statistically significant, we'd have to run a test in some kind of software package. For the moment, we get a visual intuition that there probably is a main effect, even though there wasn't an interaction. Okay, let's go on one more time and ask about the main effect of hemisphere. One more time, what we'll do is we'll take an average of these two, and that average would be right about here on our y-axis. Similarly, we'll look at these two like terms. We'll take their average, which would be right about here, and that's noticeably lower than it had been before. So there's a pretty good chance that in this case, we actually do have an effective hemisphere with the right hemisphere, shown here in the darker bars, typically generating more errors than the left hemisphere is generating. So what we've described in this graph, it looks fairly simple. It's only a two by two, but we've already been able to look at the interaction effect as well as the main effect of factor A, if you will, type of task, and the main effect of factor B. What I'd like to emphasize here is that in all cases, the main effects are independent from each other, and they are independent from the interaction effect. You can have any combination of significant or non-significant interactions and main effects. Those are entirely independent phenomena. Okay. Just to remind you about how cool this is, a little while back in this video, we talked about the importance of having a zero in the lower left corner. If we don't have a zero there, we lose proportionality. What you might want to do as a scientist is occasionally emphasize the differences here, even though you're losing proportionality. The honest way to do that in science is to signify very clearly to your audience that this is a broken axis and that there's no claim here about proportionality. Okay. When we are in the classroom together, we'll come back and we'll do some more exercises in trying to pull out interaction effects and main effects from graphs like this. <clears throat> okay, we'll zoom ahead. And we'll come now to a second trick uh, that we'll learn about in this video. And this will be a trick for pulling out interactions from tables. But for the moment, I'm going to ask you to stop the video and jot down what you think is clear or unclear about this trick that we've learned for pulling out interactions from graphs. Okay, welcome back. And we're now going to learn a second trick for pulling out interactions, but now rather than pulling out the interactions from graphs, we'll see what we can do to pull out interactions from tables. Sometimes you'll find that the information that comes your way, either in a science class or some other component of your life, that information might come across to you in a table form rather than in a graphical form. And because we have tables, it's not so easy to see parallel lines or non-parallel lines, so we, we need a different kind of a trick. It's based on a similar principle, though. This trick is called the subtraction method, and let's read it to you from here. The subtraction method for finding interactions involves comparing the differences between the means in each row of a means table. And we can do this by comparing the rows and their differences, or alternatively, we can use the columns. It doesn't really matter whether you use rows or columns, but once you start analyzing a table using either rows, uh, using rows, for example, you'd want to stay with the rows. If you start out uh, analyzing with columns, you'd want to stay with columns. Okay, to the extent that the differences are different, there is evidence for an interaction. Okay, so this is a phrase that confuses students every year because it sounds like doublespeak, this idea of different differences. But we might make this a mantra, and it goes like this. A interaction is evidenced by different differences. Can you say that with me? An interaction is evidenced by different differences. 
There you go. It sounds like a mouthful, but we'll see if we can pull this out of the tables that we're going to see here. So once again, we'll work with a simple two by two. This is the simplest kind of complex design that we can have. In this particular case, we're measuring some dependent variable that is not specified here, but we're measuring it as a function of task difficulty, which comes in two flavors, the easy task and the hard task. And we're also measuring it at two different anxiety levels. We're measuring performance in the high anxiety condition, as well as the low anxiety condition. And what we're asking here is whether there's an interaction. So we're going to use a subtraction method and see to what extent we might have different differences. Let's go with a rows-based analysis here. We're going to look at the first row, and then we'll look at the second row. Using the subtraction method, we're going to take this number, 3-ish, we will subtract from it this number, which is 3-ish. And as you might imagine, 3-ish minus 3-ish gives us a zero difference. Metaphorically, I'm going to ask you to take that zero difference and put it in your back right pocket. So we've got a zero back here. Okay, that's one of our differences. Let's play the same game down here at the high anxiety level, which is the lowest row in this particular table. We're going to take 5-ish minus 1-ish, and we're going to come up with a difference of 4-ish. And we're going to take that and put it in our back left pocket. So now we have two differences. We'll take those out. Here's one, here's the other, and we actually have a zero difference versus a difference of four. Those are not the same number. Those are different differences. To the extent that we have different differences, we have evidence for an interaction. So in this particular case, this table would suggest to us that there probably is an interaction going on inside of the data set. One way to think about this maybe more intuitively is if we were to plot this going from three to three would give us a flat line, whereas going from five to one would give us a sloped line. We'd have a flat line and a sloped line, and those would be crisscrossing. So you could perhaps mentally imagine these, but sometimes it's simply easier to take different scores. One more point about this, we used rows in this case, but we could have used columns. We could have done it this way. Three-ish minus five-ish gives us negative two. We're gonna take a negative two and stick it in one pocket. Then we'll take positive three minus one. That'll give us positive two as a difference. We'll put that in our other pocket. We have a minus two versus a positive two. Those are different differences. Again, whether we used columns or if we had used rows, we come to different differences. We wind up with evidence for an interaction. <clears throat> okay, so let's go ahead and skip a little bit and give you the opportunity to jot down whether you've had any questions on this subtraction method that's most relevant for finding interactions in tables. You can go ahead and stop the video. Okay, welcome back. Now what we'll do is we'll move on to a slightly more complicated complex design. So far we've been taking relatively simple examples where we had just two independent variables. A moment ago we had a two by three, most recently we've had a two by two, we're now going to increase the complexity by actually adding a third independent variable, just so you get a feel for how, um, how complicated you can make these factorial designs. In this case, we'll consider the simplest kind of three-way design. This is a two by two by two. This is called a three-way design because we have three different independent variables, each of which happens to have two levels. So it's a two by two by two. Okay? The first problem that we encounter is how do we begin to graph this thing? You can imagine that's a problem because we only have two spatial dimensions on any graph that we might typically construct. So how do we now somehow express that third variable? Just to remind you, we already take up the y-axis, one of our two spatial variables, for the dependent variable. We take our first independent variable, put that on the x-axis. We can take our second independent variable and we can parameterize that by using different colors, for example, different symbols that might correspond to different levels of our second independent variable. But then we also have this third independent variable. Now what do we do? Usually the answer is this. We simply create a whole other graph. And we take the third variable, and each of its levels gets its own graph. So you can see that here, where we are plotting mean hiring rate as a function of applicant weight with the gender of the applicant as the parameter. We also have yet another variable. This would be our third independent variable. And it appears to be something called body schema. And body schema comes in the low level as well as the high level for body schema. You might remember that schema can be defined as organized bits of knowledge. That's something that we go over quite extensively in Intro to Psych. So when we're talking about organized bits of knowledge in this particular context, we might be asking the question, how is it that people see themselves? What kinds of organized bits of knowledge 
might they have regarding their own body image? And we can put folks into the low body schema condition or the high body schema condition. And we're looking at their hiring rates as a function of their own weight as in addition to their gender. And the question that we might ask in this relatively complicated two by two by two design is this. Is there an interaction? Well, let you think about that for a moment. And hopefully there's a little bit of confusion for you, okay? And if you're a little bit confused, then you're right where you should be. Because the answer here is, it depends. If we look just at this graph alone, there's really no evidence for an interaction. And the reason for that is that these two lines are very parallel to each other. So we have no evidence for an interaction. If we use that same trick over here, we can see quite a strong departure from parallelism. We're getting a very small difference at this level and a very big difference at that level. So we could use either the subtraction method or we could use the parallel line trick and we find out that yes, we have an interaction here, but no, we don't have an interaction here. So our two-way interaction, that is the interaction between two variables, in this case, the gender of the applicant and the applicant weight, depended entirely on which level of the third variable we were analyzing. If we analyzed the high body schema, we had an interaction. By contrast, if we analyzed the low body schema, we did not have an interaction. Okay? So uh, one of the ways of thinking about this is that we can say that we have a three-way interaction when the two-way interaction depends on the level of the third variable, as is the case here. If we're at the high body schema, level of the third variable, significant two-way interaction. But over here, no significant two-way interaction. Okay, we'll go over a couple of examples inside of class, but what we might say more generally is this. For a two-factor experiment, that's something like an A by B, we can have a main effective factor A, we can have a main effective factor B, and we can have an A by B interaction. Once we bump it up a notch and we go to a three-factor experiment where we have factor A, B, and C, we can have a main effect for each of those variables, that is a main effect for factor A, separately a main effect for factor B, separately a main effect for factor C, and we can have many, many different kinds of interactions. We could have, for example, a two-way interaction between A and B, or between A and C, and between B and C. In each of those cases, we would be averaging over or ignoring the third variable. And then we can also have a three-way interaction, an A by B by C interaction. So the point about all this is that things get complicated very, very quickly once we get inside of these factorial designs. This is why we call them complex designs. Okay, so we'll now return to the more humble A by B design, and we'll see if we can work, you, uh, work through a few other kinds of issues that might come up when we're trying to think about this notion of interactions. We should be careful about reporting interactions if we have reason to believe there might be floor or ceiling effects. Just to remind you, a floor effect would occur in any kind of task that you might administer when the task is too hard. Behavior is going to be very poor, it's going to be all the way down at the bottom of the scale, it's going to be on the floor, so to speak. Alternatively, we can have a ceiling effect when the task that we're giving our participants is far too easy and everybody's performing perfectly across the different tasks that we might give them. So sometimes behavior is on the ceiling, sometimes behavior is on the floor. We're usually trying to look at tasks that generate some kind of mid-range of behavior, neither on the ceiling nor on the floor. Let's see what happens though if we do have floor or ceiling effects. Okay? Here, you might be developing an intuition that there is first an interaction. We start out going parallel, but then after the second level, we wind up uh, getting a departure from parallelism. From the top, we can say that in this graph, the percentage of exercises completed is plotted as a function of the amount of practice expressed in minutes. And the two parameters, or the parameter that we have here, which comes in two levels, would be the kinds of exercises, whether we have easy exercises or hard or difficult exercises. And you can see that we get this nice trend for the hard exercises, uh, an increase in the percentage of exercises completed as we practice more, but we don't have such a linearly uh, changing trend if we're in the easy task. So we're going to get an interaction, but we're getting an interaction here for a pretty uninteresting reason. We're starting pretty close to the ceiling, and in fact we're stuck to the ceiling over some portion of the x-axis range. So yes, strictly speaking there's an interaction, but it's not all that interesting because we have this case of a ceiling effect. Okay. Let's also see if we can get into the habit of looking at figuring out the interactions first, and then after there's some determination about whether we have an interaction, then we might begin to evaluate the main effects second. And the reason for that is if we have an interaction, then the main effects get to be a little bit difficult to interpret. Okay, so let's see if we can take an example here. In this graph, 
the probability of finding a spouse is plotted as a function of gender, with the age of the person as the parameter. Okay? Now, hopefully you can see that we have really, really strong evidence here for an interaction. We're getting a crisscross. Okay? So very strong evidence for an interaction in this case. Now, what might be misleading is to say that there is actually no effect of gender as the main, uh, there would be no significant main effect of gender. Why would that be misleading? Well, on the one hand, it's factually true. If we take the average of these two, that works out to be about 0.5. If we take the average of these two, that works out to be about 0.5. So we're getting a 0.5 value on average for the males and a 0.5 value on average for females. So on average, there is no difference between males and females. Strictly speaking, there is no main effect for gender. The reason that's a little bit misleading is, given the interaction, we can see that we have wildly different patterns for men versus women. That is to say, if we look at the males on the left side, as we go from young to old, the probability of finding a spouse goes up. We get exactly the opposite pattern here for women. As we go from young to old, the probability of finding a spouse goes down. Just to assure you, I've made these data up for illustrative purposes. These are based on absolutely nothing. You shouldn't uh, worry about whether this really is a trend in finding a spouse. The point about this all is that if we have an interaction, the interpretation of a main effect might get to be very difficult. So we usually look for the interactions first, and if they're there, frequently we don't further analyze the main effects. We could, but usually that interpretation becomes very difficult. Okay, let's see if we can now move on and ask one last question for today's session, and that is, what's wrong with this graph? We'll let you think that through just for a moment. Okay, some of you might be able to see something fairly obviously wrong with this graph, but the answer is not what it had been the last time we asked a similar question. Here we actually are retaining proportionality because we have a zero in the lower left corner. So that much is okay. The problem is that we have a categorical independent variable, and yet we're using a line graph. And that usually is problematic because it's not always the case that there is a smoothly continuing variation between one level of your categorical variable and the other level of your categorical variable. So graphs like this with categorical x-axis values are better graphed by using columns than they are by using the lines that otherwise suggest some continuity between these different levels. Okay, so that's a lot. We'll begin to wrap up just by saying that today we introduced complex designs. We mentioned that these have more than one independent variable, and we're motivated to look at these because of the interactions. The interactions can be seen in graphs by using our rule for looking for non-parallel lines as evidence for an interaction, or if we happen to have a table, we can use a subtraction method and look for different differences. We frequently do like to look for interactions first because if our data set contains an interaction, then the main effect of one of our variables might become difficult to interpret. So we hope that you'll make a note of what has been clear and also not so clear in this presentation, and we look forward to having your comments in class. See you in class.